So before we get to topic five, I want to talk about uh, lab report tips again. Um, so last time I was talking about uh, graphs and titles and I want to come and return to the results. And the reason why I'm talking about the results is often this is the very first part of your lab report that people are going to work on because the rest of your report basically revolves around your results. Uh, your discussion, of course, is discussing the results. Your introduction is kind of leading to and introducing what you're, what you're going to do or what you did do. And uh, so the results really is uh, the most important part of the entire uh, experiment and, and report. So your results section is going to have two parts. It's going to have um, your graphs. And maybe I should have listed the graphs first. And uh, for lab three, you're going to make three graphs. And if you're not sure what they're supposed to look like, make sure you take a good look at the lab video that I sent. Uh, but you're going to have three graphs, and I think some people have already shared a few of these with me. And uh, that goes for anything in this class. If you have some work and you uh, are unsure, you can always visit my office hours or share it with me. And I can always give you some tips on how to improve them or make them better, or at least bring them up to biology one and seven standards. So you're going to have three graphs, by the way. So a standard curve. Uh, that's the first part of the experiment, and that is going to be absorbance on one axis and concentration on the other axis. You're going to have a graph for the temperature experiment and a graph for the solvent experiment. The other part of the, of the results is this here. So you're going to have a written component. So the written component is basically a paragraph. Some people like to do one paragraph. Some people like to do three, one for each graph. Uh, there's not really a lot to say about each graph in the results section. This is a bare bones summary of the results. So you're going to refer to each figure one at a time. So the standard curve, you'll say uh, something like in figure one, blah, blah, blah. For the temperature experiment, you might say in the temperature experiment, and then put in brackets figure two, and then explain uh, the basic trend. So you're not going to go through every data point and say at 20 degrees this happened, at 25 degrees this happened, at 30 degrees this happened, and so on. I don't want you to give all of the, of the information, but give the uh, what you see is the trend and highlight some of the important data points. So I got a couple of uh, sample sentences here, and you can see what that might look like uh, on the next slide. So notice what it does not include, your results section. Okay, your data tables. This is rough data. And this is going to go in the appendix. Okay. Uh, the graphs, of course, are the nice, polished, visually appealing data. The rough data is going to go in the appendix at the back of your, of your report. And you get a couple of marks for just including them. Uh, no questions asked. Um, your results also does not include a discussion or interpretation of the results. That, of course, is for the discussion section of the report. And I will be talking about the discussion uh, next week at some point here. So uh, the written part, it says be brief, but you want to be specific and very clear and informative. So here are a couple of examples of what uh, sentences in your, uh, in your uh, results section might look like. Uh, so you can see the first one, it says it was found that the most extreme temperatures caused the largest amount of beta cyan leakage. The minus 20 degrees Celsius treatment resulted in 16 micromoles per liter of leakage. And the 85 degrees Celsius resulted in 10.5 micrometers per mole of leakage, and then in brackets, figure two. The second one says, the highest temperatures and the lowest temperatures gave the highest absorbent values demonstrating the extreme temperatures damage membranes the most. Uh, hoping it is really obvious here which one is better. This one here. So why is this one better? So notice this word here, specific. Uh, I'm not just saying things like highest or lowest. I'm actually saying minus 20. And 85. So I'm actually being specific. I'm saying at this temperature, we had the most, uh, the most leakage. Um, and I'm actually telling you exactly how much because, uh, you know, just saying a lot or a whole bunch or big, these words don't really mean anything. Um, everything is very relative. But if you give me a precise number, uh, I have an idea in my mind uh, how much 16 micromolars is, or at least I can compare 16 to 10.5, and I know how big those numbers are relative to one another. Uh, notice the other thing is that it is referring to the data. So if someone wants all of the data, they want to see it all together, they can go to figure two. So you're going to have uh, 
probably for each uh, each graph, maybe a couple of sentences, maybe three or four if you're really wordy and you like shorter sentences, that kind of thing. But uh, overall, um, the results, uh, written part of the results is going to be maybe half a page. And then, of course, you can have the three actual graphs. All right, so that's it for formal lab tips for today. Uh, like I said, reach out to me if you have any um, questions or if you want to run by a sentence or two by, by me or anything like that, I will look at anything you have. If it's a small amount or if you have a big amount, I can take a look at it. Uh, obviously, the, uh, the more warning I get, the better. Uh, if it's the day before the lab is due, I, I may not have time. So the sooner, the better. All right, so back to prokaryotes. And if you recall, uh, last day we left off basically here and we had compared the eukaryotes and the prokaryotes and we talked a little bit about the archaea. A little bit about the archaea. So today we wanna to talk about the bacteria. The bacteria are the most um, abundant of the prokaryotes compared to the archaea. And uh, we know way more about them in terms of uh, their biology and those kind of things because they're easy to grow and, and we have a huge interest in bacteria because of course many of them do make us uh, ill. So what do bacteria do? Let's talk about that. Um, most of them do not make us sick. Um, most of them are out there in the environment doing other things. They're not interested in us. Uh, many of them live with us symbiotically. So this is E. coli. Everyone likes to make E. coli the villain. Uh, e. coli lives in your gut, uh, in your intestines, and uh, it's very happy there. You're giving it food and moisture and warmth, and you're a great incubator, and E. coli is helping you out. It's actually making vitamin K. And so it's a symbiotic relationship most of the time. Sometimes E. coli can cause some troubles. Uh, there are different strains of E. coli too that can cause some troubles. And uh, so maybe more on that later. Uh, some do cause nasty diseases. Uh, this one here, Yersinia pestis. Uh, this is the uh, bacterium that looks a lot like E. coli, but it is not E. coli. This one causes the Black Death, also known as the plague. And uh, this was obviously a massive problem, killed many people years ago. And uh, today, not so many. Uh, many bacteria are photosynthetic. Uh, this particular uh, type of organism, these cyanobacteria, cyan, it kind of means greeny blue color. And uh, these are carbon fixers. So they make one of our favorite molecules as animals. We love oxygen. And these make maybe half the oxygen on the planet. Uh, it's kind of hard to guess the number, but it's found in swamps, they're found in oceans, and they make tons and tons of oxygen. So we like these guys. Um, many bacteria are an important part of uh, nutrient cycles and decomposition. Um, this is showing um, these are root nodules and legumes. So legumes are like peas and beans, and, and they have uh, bacteria that live with them symbiotically, and they take nitrogen out of the air and provide nitrates in the soil. And so these things actually help fertilize uh, these particular plants. So that's great for these plants. And of course, they're just found in so many things. Uh, you can see I have uh, industries listed. So we make yogurt out of bacteria. There's many biotechnology applications. Um, some of them are part of our human nutrition. Some of them help cows digest their food. Uh, I could go on and on about all sorts of different products and, uh, and uses for bacteria. But uh, we're going to move on. We want to talk about some of the cellular biology of these things. So here's kind of your um, typical, um, I guess we could call it a prokaryotic cell. And you can see there's a whole bunch of features there. And uh, we're going to go through these things one by one and uh, kind of talk about what they do. And uh, I'm going to make some notes as well. Uh, normally, uh, I do this on the whiteboard. Uh, just like uh, last time, what I'm going to do is some notes on, um, on a Microsoft Word document. And I'll flip back and forth uh, between my screens uh, as I take the notes as we go along. So remember, this thing has no nucleus, but it does have DNA. It is a fully functional cell. All right, so this is a good place to start, uh, the cytoplasm. So this here is an image by uh, an artist. His name is David Goodsell, and he actually is a biochemist as well. And he does these, uh, these really nice um, artwork of of all sorts of biochemical processes and whatnot. And he tries to make them as accurate as possible. And so you can see what he's showing here is um, E. coli. 
and you can see uh, the cytoplasm is uh, it's just full of all sorts of goodies. And uh, I'll show you what some of these things are. I have them uh, labeled on my diagram. Uh, so some of these things, for example, are ribosomes, uh, messenger RNA. And you can see in brackets, I've, uh, I've put what these, uh, what these things are made of in terms of the macromolecules. So ribosomes are RNA and proteins. And we'll, we'll talk about those in a few minutes. Um, there's transfer RNA there. And um, actually, it looks like ribosomes are the first thing to talk about. All right, let's talk about ribosomes. <laughs> um, so what is a ribosome? Uh, a ribosome is made out of, uh, I mentioned RNA and protein. And um, so you can see what they're trying to show here is the, is the breakdown of these ribosomes. So ribosomes, by the way, uh, if you take a look here, there's, there's um, prokaryotic ribosomes and there's eukaryotic ribosomes. Uh, it turns out there's a difference here in these things, that eukaryotic ribosomes are a little bit bigger. So you can see this number here, 70S versus uh, 80S. Um, that actually stands for Spedberg units. That was um, a Swedish guy who was studying these things, and so they named the units after him. Um, don't really need to know what an S is beyond that. But a bigger number means a bigger ribosome is what we're looking at. And uh, so it turns out that eukaryotic and prokaryotic ribosomes are uh, unique. Uh, they're made out of two subunits. So we have something here called the large subunit and the small subunit. You're probably thinking 50 and 30 do not add up to 70. And that's okay. That's not how Svedberg units work. They're not like mass. They have more to do with uh, the speed at which these things sediment in a, in a centrifuge. Um, and uh, ribosomes, of course, um, are made of, like I said, RNA and proteins. And they are the, uh, the site of, um, of uh, translation. So let's make a note about that. Just switch to my Word document. And uh, let's see here, there it is right there. There's my Word document. I guess I meant to put ribosomes first, so why don't I do that? And actually I will put two things first. I will put cytoplasm. Okay, so you can see the, the table I'm gonna make. We've got the structure. What is it made of and what does it do? So basically uh, three columns. So the cytoplasm is, of course, mostly water, uh, but it contains solutes, enzymes, and uh, just trying to think what else is in a cytoplasm that's worth mentioning. Uh, by solutes, I mean food and salts and, and all sorts of other things. So maybe that's the uh, maybe that's the best way to say it. So water and enzymes. So what is the cytoplasm? Cytoplasm is, uh, let's say the main, we'll call it area of the cell, the cell. And this is the location of cellular chemical reactions. I guess I can just say chemical reactions. Enzymes, DNA, and everything else. So I will just take a cellular out of that. It's Certainly an unnecessary word. Sometimes simpler is better. So location of chemical reactions, enzymes, and DNA. And uh, so the, um, the uh, cytoplasm, uh, like I was showing you that picture, you gotta sort of think of it as not necessarily a, a fully liquid. It's actually a bit more like a, like, like a gel because it's loaded with all sorts of things. All right, second one I have is ribosomes. And um, I like colors, so I'm just gonna make that one a different color so it's, it's a nice table. So what are ribosomes made of? Ribosomes are made of ribosomal RNA. So that little R stands for ribosomal RNA. And uh, it's made of proteins. So ribosomes are the site of translation. So if you don't know what translation is, I'll write a definition of this. This is where um, the ribosome binds messenger RNA and uses uses the genetic sequence to uh, link amino acids together. And hopefully it's implied in the right sequence. So you can think of this as protein synthesis. So that's what translation is. And we're gonna talk a lot about translation later on in the semester. I think it's topic 14 or 15 or something like that. Um, maybe 16, I'm not sure, we'll get there. We're not even close, um, but that's what ribosomes do. Side of translation, protein synthesis, 
Uh, the details we're going to worry about later on in the semester. Okay, so back to the PowerPoint. If you um, didn't get all that, I would be flipping back and forth, and you can you can worry about that then. Um, okay, so there's the ribosomes. Much much more on ribosomes. What else do we have here? We have enzymes. Um, we're going to talk about enzymes later on in the semester too. So enzymes, of course, are biological catalysts. They perform uh, chemical reactions, and uh, so maybe maybe that's worth a note too. Let's put that in there. Just to remind people what enzymes are. So I'm just going to add another, uh, another row of enzymes. And what are enzymes made of? They are made of protein, and these are catalysts. So they speed up uh, chemical reactions. Hopefully, you knew that one. That's an easy one. Uh, what else do we have here? If you take a close look, we have DNA there. So all this yellow stuff in the diagram is DNA. And uh, actually, if you look carefully, uh, this little thing here right in the middle is actually supposed to be a DNA polymerase. And if you look at that DNA polymerase, you have one strand of DNA going in and two strands of DNA coming up. So this guy really uh, has paid a lot of attention to detail, or at least given a lot of thought into it in terms of how his uh, diagram is going. So let's talk about the DNA in a bacteria. Uh, the DNA is not in a nucleus. We already talked about that a few times already, uh, but it does often show up in an electron microscope. So if you take a look at this one here, this is actually what we're seeing on the top is, is a dividing cell. And uh, so the DNA has replicated. There's two copies of it. And uh, so you can see one copy here on the, uh, on the left and one copy here on the right. And uh, it is often visible under an electron micrograph because it's very, very dense and there's lots of phosphorus in there. And uh, so often um, it's not called the nucleus, but often they will talk about this dark region in a cell called the nucleoid region. So the nucleoid region, of course, is just where the DNA is. Um, so you might see this note here that uh, bacterial DNA is uh, a loop. So it's, um, it's uh, uh, not necessarily like a hula hoop. Um, it's a bit more kind of like this, right? It's all, it's all packaged up and, and, uh, and compacted and uh, it forms a complete circular structure though. And usually there's only one chromosome in bacteria unless they're replicating. Um, I'll, I'll write a note on, on the chromosome in a moment. Uh, so one other thing to know is that a lot of bacteria have plasmids. Not all of them do. Uh, this is a sometimes thing. And a plasmid, you can see, is kind of like a, a little mini chromosome. So it's a loop of DNA. And it, um, uh, so uh, in E. coli, uh, you might have uh, E. coli has about 4,400 genes. So your typical plasmid is like three to five genes. So it's really like a very many chromosome. Um, so why, why do you have these plasmids? That's kind of a really good question. So it turns out that plasmids, um, sometimes they give uh, an extra trait that will help the organism survive. And so if you take a look at these, for example, this is the big one that we're most concerned about, of course, is antibiotic resistance. So sometimes these, um, these plasmids have a couple of genes on them that help a, a bacterial organism resist, disease, resist uh, treatment. Um, so this is helping the organism survive, and it certainly is not helping us uh, in our cases. You can see there's other things on here. We haven't talked about where pillus is, but it's also important in pathogenesis. And uh, toxins, of course, help them with help them to produce disease as well. Um, lots of different reasons why they have plasmids, but it's usually just extra DNA. And if it's helpful to keep them sur to survive, uh, then they're gonna hold on to that DNA. And this is something that bacteria do. It's very easy for them to, uh, to swap and, and exchange plasmids and get that little bit of extra DNA. All right, so let's, uh, let's write a couple of notes on these things. So I guess I can take out ribosomes there. So the nucleoid, what is the nucleoid? The nucleoid uh, has the chromosome. So what do I mean by the chromosome? The chromosome is, the, is DNA plus associated proteins. So DNA has uh, proteins that kind of help, um, help keep it tidy. Uh, you can think of them as packaging proteins. Uh, they're a lot less in bacterial uh, chromosomes than in, uh, than in human chromosomes, uh, but there are associated proteins that are helping the whole thing uh, uh, you know, not get all tangled and, and whatnot. And uh, what is the function of DNA? Contains the um, genome or genetic material, whichever you want to call it. 
So what is a plasmid? Plasmid is just DNA. You could put circular DNA if you wanted to. And um, there, there's not usually any associated proteins with, uh, with plasmids. And um, so what is the function? Contains extra genes. So I'll just put it like that because sometimes it's just one gene that may help the organism to survive. And the example that you should know is, uh, for example, a gene for antibiotic resistance. All right, so back to the PowerPoint. Like I said, if you missed this, you can always um, check back later when we will come back to that. All right, so DNA. And uh, DNA, of course, um, it replicates. And uh, I think I'd mentioned before, we we're gonna talk a little bit about um, mitosis and meiosis. That's topic uh, 10, I think, or something like that, or maybe it's topic 12. Um, but let's talk about how bacteria um, um, reproduce. Uh, the process of bacterial reproduction is actually called binary fission. So this is different from mitosis and meiosis. So you probably remember mitosis and meiosis from high school and you've got all those spindle fibers and you got uh, all those stages, the uh, prophase and metaphase and you know, anaphase and telophase and all that. Um, we only have one chromosome here. So it's not quite as complicated. Uh, so we don't need to do a lot of those fancy steps. So let's take a quick look at this. So notice um, what's happening in this first step is we actually have the, uh, the one chromosome and it's starting to, uh, to replicate. So replicate means it's making a copy. So we'll have, we'll have two copies in the end. And uh, notice this comment I have here about chromosomes attaching to the membrane. So you can take a look here. It's actually attaching right here and right here. So we have two, um, two copies of uh, the chromosome, each attached to one end of the membrane. And so the cell is gonna grow. And as they grow, the cells grow longer and skinnier. So you can see this, that as the cell grows longer, uh, one chromosome right here, is towed to the left-hand side and the other chromosome is towed over to the right-hand side. So no need for spindle fibers, um, nothing too fancy that really needs to go on. Uh, the last step, of course, is the two cells are eventually going to, uh, are going to form a septum. They're gonna, they're gonna split off and, and uh, the membrane will pinch off and you'll form a, a new cell wall in between. So that's binary fission. So binary, of course, means two, fission means splitting in two. So it's kind of just a, um, whoever coined the term, it's kind of uh, kind of basic. I think I've got a couple of videos Not here. Prokaryotic organisms are mainly oh. unicellular. Of they, they reproduce do. by fission. There we go. Just going to re remove the volume <laughs> from that. Uh, anyway, you can see there's a couple of videos, and if you watch, you can see the uh, the cells elongate and split, elongate and split, elongate and split, and uh, they can actually do this pretty quickly uh, for E. coli. Um, very easily in the lab, 20 to 30 minutes. These things can reproduce very, very rapidly. Uh, on the bottom, we have uh, streptococcus, and uh, coccus, of course, means they're circles. And uh, so they're, the process is just a, a slightly different, but really the same basic idea. All right, so moving on. Um, a quick test yourself question. So true or false? Let's take a look at these. Uh, true or false? Bacteria divide by binary fission and archaea divide by mitosis. So we just talked about this. This is true. Archaea do not divide by mitosis. Archaea are also prokaryotes, and so they also divide by binary fission. So who divides by mitosis? Eukaryotes do. So maybe I can put a note on that. Eukaryotes only. Uh, number two, true or false? The nucleoid region is surrounded by a membrane. That one is also false. And um, by definition, a, uh, a prokaryote does not have a nuclear membrane. So the nucleoid is, is not membrane bound. It's just where the DNA is basically. Uh, Question three, true or false? The prokaryotic ribosomes contain 60S and 40S subunits. Um, so you're probably remembering that actually the actual numbers are 50S and 30S. So that was also false. All three false. 
course, my fives just look terrible. I'm trying to make a better five. There we go. Uh, all true or false. So the last one is a little specific, but uh, maybe maybe remember the details there. Uh, okay, I guess I thought the slide was a little bit earlier, but uh, there's the comparison between binary fission and mitosis. So mitosis, remember you've got, uh, so let's take a look at this. We've got our interphase up here and this here. Um, looks like we've got uh, telo uh, prophase, and uh, looks like we have metaphase here, anaphase, and then telophase. So all those different steps going on with the spindle fibers and all that. And the last one, of course, is cytokinesis, and we will uh, we will visit that in topic twelve. So back to this picture. Um, the big part of what we want to talk about today is what's going on over here at the cell surface. So if you remember, we were talking about cell membranes and cell walls um, earlier this week and last week. And uh, so this is E. coli. E. coli, of course, is a, uh, if you remember what type of bacteria it is, it is a gram negative. You probably remember what, um, what was a gram negative again? Well, a gram negative, they stain pink, not purple. And they have this uh, unique cell wall structure, which I kind of called like a, cell wall sandwich. So you have two membranes. You have an inner membrane, and the inner membrane, of course, is just your typical uh, uh, fluid mosaic model where you have lipids and proteins in it. Uh, in between, you have the peptidoglycan. That's the uh, uh, carbohydrate that's rigid, and it's made of carbohydrates and peptides. And of course, we have our outer membrane, which is also made of lipids and proteins as well, and, uh, and carbohydrates, by the way. So uh, here's some pictures, and we, we looked at these pictures here last uh, time uh, when we were talking about cell walls, and uh, there's our gram positives. Like I said, remember they stain purple, and the gram negatives, of course, uh, stain kind of a pink. So you can see that's why I have the labels here, purple and, and red, to show purple and pink. So I want to talk a little bit about the gram stain procedure. We're going to be doing it in the lab next Thursday. So I'm excited to see everybody back in person next week and, uh, and super excited to be able to do the, uh, um, the bacteria lab where we get to do some gram stains. Um, so let's take a look at how this, this technique works. So what you do is uh, you get your bacterial sample, you put it on a microscope slide, and then what we do is we dry it off uh, on a Bunsen burner, so add a little bit of heat. And then what you do is you add a little bit of the uh, first stain, which is called crystal violet. So violet, of course, violet means purple, and uh, the purple kind of gets everywhere. It gets on the glass, it gets on the bacteria, and if you were to take a look at it now, mostly everything would just look purple. Um, but it's not actually at this point really well bound. And so what you do is you add something called a mordant. So mordant is kind of means a uh, fixative, and uh, in this case, what happens is, so your crystal violet, let me draw you a little picture here. So the crystal violet is uh, positively charged. There's some crystal violet here. And what you do when you throw in the iodine, so here's my iodine, it's negatively charged. And so what it does is it forms these little complexes with the iodine. And, um, and now what you had is you had small molecules, now you have large complexes. And these large complexes, they get stuck in the gram-positive cell wall. So remember, let me just go back for a second. Remember that gram-positive cell wall, it's big. And there's this huge area for those uh, complexes to kind of get trapped in. So that's what they do. Those complexes get trapped there. The gram negative cell doesn't have that thick layer. In fact, it has a, an extra membrane, which kind of doesn't let the, uh, the crystal violet really get in and permeate uh, very well into the cells. So what you do is you wash it. And um, there's a few different uh, formulas for washing. But usually, we just use a little bit of alcohol. And uh, the gram positive cells stay purple. In the gram-negative cells, the, the purple uh, color uh, washes away quite easily. So at this point, this is great. We have two types of cells. Gram-negatives aren't going to show up very well. So we throw in another stain, which is called safranin, or sometimes it's called safranin red. And uh, of course, it's a pinkish red color. And so um, um, it, it sticks to everything, by the way. But here's the thing. If you have red plus purple, what do you get? You just get darker purple. Uh, and so the gram-positive cells look the same, and the gram-negative cells turn out kind of pinkish. And so uh, I'll show you some pictures. So 
Oh, Let's talk about how gram stain is done. Sorry about that. This is uh, in a gram stain. Huh, from one of my videos. From Let's talk about how gram stain is done. In a gram stain, the <laughs> apologies. That was a nicer slide I had, but it was uh, from a video I made last year, and I admit to insert it. But we've already talked about that. Uh, here's some examples of some gram stains uh, and, and what you might see. Actually, I'm hoping you don't see all of these. Uh, we are going to uh, we're going to look at bacillus. We're going to look at E. coli. Uh, we're not going to look at these other ones. Some of these are actually pathogens. We're not going to do them in the lab. But we're going to have a variety of gram negatives and gram positives, and hopefully we get some nice uh, uh, slides and we can take some pictures of them. So that's next week in the lab. Uh, so stay tuned for that. So I'd also mentioned last week that gram negatives uh, kind of have these unique structures. And um, so one is this lipopolysaccharide, which is kind of a unique uh, um, carbohydrate uh, lipid thing that's found on the outer membrane, and it's an endotoxin. And I also mentioned that the periplasm is kind of unique to the gram negatives in that it's uh, kind of like a little, uh, a little compartment where you might have extra enzymes. And some of those enzymes are uh, helping these organisms to resist drugs like antibiotics. So not good at all. So before I get any further, um, let me just go back to here for a second. And one thing to note is that gram positives and gram negatives, this kind of represents most bacteria. But not all of them fall into these categories. And I just wanted to mention one more uh, category of, of uh, bacterial organisms that are important, at least they're important clinically. And you can see the organism that, uh, that we're most concerned about is this one here, mycobacterium tuberculosis. It causes the disease tuberculosis. And uh, this has a little bit of a different um, cell wall structure. So you may notice it's got a plasma membrane. It's got some peptidoglycan. And then it has a whole bunch of other stuff. And uh, the thing that, um, that is most unique about this are these mycolic acids. So this is, um, this is kind of a really uh, a thick, waxy structure. And so these cells here, if you do a gram stain, nothing shows up um, because the mycolic acid doesn't let any of the stains bind. So what we do is something called an acid fast procedure. I'm not going to talk about go into the whole details about that, but that that uh, you know there's obviously an acid involved, and then there's heat and other things to get the stains in. And so um, these kind of look a little different in a stain. Uh, th this particular staining process uses a blue and a fuchsia. So fuchsia is like a like a hot pink kind of color, and uh, you can see there's the uh, the cells there, um, the bacterial cells, and these. Uh, these kind of ghost-like things, these are actually the human cells are, that are found in that particular sample. So I, I won't ask about tuberculosis, but I just wanted to kind of mention it for completion to say that don't think that all bacteria are gram-positive gram negatives. There's always exceptions in biology. So let's write a note or two about um, our cell wall. And uh, there we go. So we're down. What is the cell wall made of? Mostly we're talking about peptidoglycan. So this would be, of course, carbohydrate plus peptides, or which are small amino acid sequences. And uh, you could include those other features that are kind of part of the cell wall, phospholipids and all that, but I kind of think of the cell wall as distinct from the, from the actual membrane. And what is the cell wall doing? Um, not sure if I talked about that. I guess we talked about offering protection. So we can mention that, we can say it offers protection against osmotic pressure and uh, gives a cell a shape. And uh, those are kind of the main things that a cell wall is doing. Obviously it's uh, helping it interact with this environment, helps us to gram stain these things and a few other things like that. All right, so back to the PowerPoint. Here we go. Moving along. Okay, ah, yes, another test yourself thing. Okay, um, this is cell walls. This was Monday's lecture. Let's see what we can remember. I guess I meant to put this in Kahoot, but never got around to it. Uh, so let's take a look at this. Um, we've got all sorts of different uh, cell types on one side, and we have some descriptions on the other side. So we're just talking about bacteria. 
So why don't we start there? You have gram negative bacteria and gram positive bacteria. So you're probably trying to remember, okay, which one stains purple? And the answer is gram positives. Okay, so that's good. Uh, which one of these describes gram negatives? Two membranes. All right, so hopefully that's the easy ones. Um, what else do we have in here? Okay, animals. So remember, animal cells do not have a cell wall, but they may have an extracellular matrix. Okay, uh, what else do we have here? Um, plant, fungi, and archaea. So um, <laughs> looking at the uh, description, some of them aren't, um, aren't the best, but I, I do have uh, intentions there, and I'll explain what they are. So remember, plants, uh, plant cell walls are made of cellulose. And one of the things that we talked about in the lecture is that cellulose cannot be digested by animals. And uh, so um, if you are an animal that eats cellulose, like a cow likes to eat uh, grass and, and whatnot, um, the cellulose is actually broken down by bacteria that is found in their, in their stomachs. Um, fungi is, uh, those cell walls are made of chitin. Hopefully that's an easy one. And then archaea, remember, archaea do not have peptidoglycan, uh, but they might have S layers, and they might have something called pseudopeptidoglycan. Of course, there's not a lot of room for me to write on the screen. All right, so hopefully that one wasn't too hard. Uh, it, if it was, um, you know, we do have to review the material to get it all into our brains somehow. All right, so moving on, I wanna talk about some structures that are important for uh, pathogenesis. By pathogenesis, I mean um, things that help these organisms to uh, cause disease. So the first one to know are fimbriae and pili. So these two words, I don't really like fimbriae, it's not, it doesn't roll off the tongue very nicely. Um, these two words are used basically interchangeably. Um, it, I guess if you discover something, you get to name it. And I think these things were named independently and, and realized to be the same structures. And so both words are still used in the textbooks and the scientific literature. And one thing to know is they are made into proteins, but kind of like pili, because pili, of course, starts with a P and protein starts with P. The cells may remember what they are. So what are these things? They are used for attachment. So if you take a look at this um, uh, image here, this is E. coli, and it's got these little hair-like attachments all over. You can think of these things like sticky hairs. So they're allowing it to attach to things. So I mentioned before the E. coli uh, does not normally make us sick, but sometimes there are a few strains of E. coli that have these pili, and these particular pili can attach to bladder cells. So if you have ever had a bladder infection, uh, it was probably E. coli, and it was probably one of those rare strains that has the pili uh, that can allow it to attach to that tissue. So this helps with pathogenesis. It obviously helps these things survive in the wild, that it could stick to rocks and skin and uh, trees and whatever, wherever the bacteria like to live. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about the sex pili in a moment. I think I have another picture of normal pili and fimbria. There's another picture. I love this one. This is uh, from the textbook. and, and they, um, they colorized it, just, it's just like pops out at you. And you can see the cell actually looks like it's dividing too. Uh, very, very interesting image. So um, going back there, you can see there's a, a special type of pili called a sex pili. So let's talk about that. By the way, um, these are plural, pilus is singular. So, so what is a sex pilus? Um, also called a conjugation pilus. And uh, so conjugation, if you've ever watched like a prison movie or something like that, and you may know in, in prison movies, there's almost always somebody who's having conjugal visits, right? So what's a conjugal visit? That's usually where uh, a spouse or a partner is coming and they get a private room and they get to do some intimate things, right? So that's what conjugation is. Conjugation basically means sex. Uh, but what does sex mean biologically? Um, it basically means DNA exchange. There's no reproduction going on here. So maybe it's worth writing that down, no reproduction. Okay, just a little bit of DNA exchange going on there. Uh, so here is, uh, you're looking at two bacteria that are um, literally caught in the act here. 
And um, you can see that the sex pelvis is quite a long appendage. And um, one of my textbooks actually, actually uh, described a lot like a grappling hook. And every time I think of that, I kind of laugh because um, it kind of makes suddenly bacteria sex sound a little bit more interesting. Um, you know, when you image a, a grappling hook in your head and, and what is going on there. So let's just take a look at the process here for a minute and talk about why this is uh, super important. So if you take a look here, we have um, two cells and uh, um, the first cell is called an F plus cell. So F stands for fertility. And uh, geneticists like to talk about if something has a trait, they give it a plus. If it doesn't have a trait, they give it a minus, right? So um, it also has an F plasmid. And so the F plasmid is, uh, is like I said, it's a little ring of, of DNA and it has a few genes on it. And um, what it does is it actually has the instructions for making the sex pills. So that first step, the grappling hook stage where it produces the pillows and it grabs onto a neighboring cell. And the neighboring cell uh, does not even have to be the same species. I'll, uh, I'll get back to why that's important in a moment. So there they are, the cells are kind of pulled in closer to one another. And um, what we think is happening, I don't think this has actually been fully proven, but we have um, your DNA of course is double stranded, the double helix, and we believe one strand uh, goes through the pillars and ends up in the second cell. And so now suddenly you have two cells that are fertile, two cells able to make this pillus and exchange DNA. So why is this important? Well, we were just talking about antibiotic resistance, and this is how that they can spread antibiotic resistance and they can do it even between different species. This is very scary. And so every time there's a new gene for antibiotic resistance, scientists are watching these things carefully trying to figure out how to prevent the spread and how to prevent it to spread between different, um, different organisms as well. All right, so I think I thought I had another picture of this. So this, by the way, um, just recently, somebody was uh, doing some fluorescent microscopy and we were kind of uh, able to show this in action. And I don't think this is in real time. I think it's been sped up a little bit, but uh, just thought I'd show you that little video there. Very, very cool. All right, I'll make some notes on, on, um, on Fimbria and Pili in a moment. I wanna give you one more F word for today. <laughs> so you can go home and, and tell everyone you learned a few F words and uh, maybe surprise them with your amazing scientific knowledge. Um, I wanna talk about um, how uh, bacteria are motile. So motile basically means swimming. And you can in fact see some, uh, uh, this is some E. coli swimming around on a glass slide right there. So how are um, bacteria motile? They have something called flagella. So one is called a flagellum. Many are called flagella. And uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about flagella in more detail when we get to uh, topic seven. Um, but here's the basic structure. So you can see we have this, um, this section here that anchors the whole thing into the, uh, the membrane. This one here is actually gram negative. You can see you've got the two membranes and the peptidoglycan, and it's embedded in there. And uh, it, it's called a motor. I've also seen the term basal body. And what this motor is, is it it's a, it's actually a rotates the, um, the tail part of, fl of the flagella. So it rotates like a, like a propeller. And uh, it can go clockwise and counterclockwise. And I think I have a little animation here and you can see there's the flagella. And that's how basically it swims through the medium. And of course, this is really important. Uh, these organisms, they wanna find food and they wanna to move towards it. And it also helps them invade new body tissues if they ever get an infection. Uh, not all bacteria have these flagella, uh, but, uh, but many of them do and, and it does make them more pathogenic. So um, one thing to know about flagella, and uh, like I said, more on these later in topic seven, um, we have flagella in prokaryotes, and you can see this little arrow showing that it, uh, that it rotates. We also have flagella in eukaryotes, which are very different structures. The same name, uh, but very different structures. And these things actually move back and forth a little bit more like, uh, like whips or tails uh, up and down as opposed to uh, this rotational motion. But more on these, on these later. I have a couple more pictures of flagella. There's, of course, many different types. Um, some of them are uh, organisms have one, some have two, some have many, and uh, sometimes they show up in stains. 
And uh, there's some some videos for you. You can see this one here on the left is uh, is really cool. It's some fluorescence, and you can actually see the rotation of the flagella there. Uh, that E. coli one, I think I've showed you that one already. And then the one on the bottom is tethered streptococcal cells. So tethered means they're attached to the glass slide and they can't move. But even if they can't move, they can still rotate. So you can see some of them are spinning around in that little video. I'll play it for you one more time. There we go. So I think I have one more slide just showing you some flagella. Um, they're very, very interesting structures. Let me see here. Uh, there's one other kind of flagella that's kind of worth mentioning is that some organisms actually have the flagella built into their membrane. So this is called an endoflagella. You can see this is a gram-negative organism and the uh, flagellum is, uh, it, it is built right in the periplasm. So these organisms here, uh, the whole organism actually corkscrews. And there's the organism there you can see in the video. Uh, this is the organism Borrelia. It, it causes uh, Lyme disease and uh, it's very good at burrowing to new uh, tissues and organ systems, which is one reason why Lyme disease is, is not good to have uh, if you don't get it treated right away. Okay, so I should go back and make a few notes here. What did we miss? Okay, fimbriae and pili. So these, of course, are made out of proteins and proteins only. And what are they used for? So these are used for attachment to surfaces. Attachment to surfaces. And uh, can't spell, there we go, surfaces. And the example I gave was uh, bladder cells. So hopefully we don't get any of those. And uh, we also have the sex pillus. And this is used for conjugation. What was conjugation? Conjugation was DNA exchange. All right, so we also talked about flagella. So I'm just gonna move down. Flagella are also made of proteins. And these are used for, for movement. They use the word motility as a scientific word. Remember that bacteria, flagella, bacterial flagella, rotate clockwise and counterclockwise. There we go. All right, we have a couple more minutes and we'll, we'll just talk about one more uh, structure here. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up for today. So I wanted, I, we're talking about these um, um, flagella and fimbriae, right? So remember, get your words straight, which is which. The fimbriae and pili are these little um, hair-like things. Flagella are, are a little bit more like tails. And these are, of course, all made out of proteins. Uh, but I want to talk about something not made of proteins. And these are the glycocalyx. So glycocalyx, remember glyco means carbohydrate or sugar, and calyx means coat. So these are sugar coats. And uh, there's two types, uh, capsules and slime layers. Um, again, this is something where the words are used interchangeably all the time, because uh, if you discover it, if you study that organism, you can call it a capsule if you want. You can call it a slime layer if you want. Generally, capsules are a little tighter and more organized, and slime layers are more loose and goopy. And you actually see these on organisms um, in that uh, uh, things with capsules and slime layers, uh, when they grow in a petri dish, they, they tend to be more gooey and slimy. And uh, that's because these carbohydrates actually absorb a lot of water, and that makes them very sticky. So what do these things do? These things help these organisms to attach to things. So in the environment, they can attach to all sorts of surfaces. In this case here, what you're looking at is streptococcus attaching to a tonsil cell. So this one here is Looks like it's giving somebody some strep throat. Uh, the other thing that these glycocalyx can do is they can actually help these things to evade uh, the immune system. So immune cells, they, they try to grab on, and of course they're slimy, and it's really hard to grab onto slimy things. And so um, the immune system has a little bit of a harder time dealing with these things because they're kind of slimy. All right, I think I had, uh, you know, I had a couple more things, but what I'm going to do is, uh, um, oh, somebody says they don't see anything but the table notes. Sorry. There's the slides. I'll make the note. I'll, I'll make the note in a moment. Sorry about that. I forgot to share my uh, PowerPoint. Uh, there's some pictures of, of uh, capsules and slime layers. So, like I said, remember the, the, the 
The technical term is glycocalyx. Capsules are neatly organized and slime layers are goopy. And then here's the one of the tonsil cell. So I'll make a, I'll make a note and maybe what I'll do is come back and jog your memory on uh, next lecture. So glycocalyx are made out of carbohydrates only. Carbohydrates. Remember that capsules are just more organized and slime layers are, um, are a little bit more goopy. And what do these do? These are used for attachment to surfaces. An example I just gave you was somebody's tonsils, unfortunately for that person. And also allow the cells, allow the bacteria to evade immune cells. Not completely, it just makes it harder for the immune cells to grab onto them. Like I said, uh, you can imagine anything that's slimy is just a bit harder to grab onto in general. And so the immune cells have a little bit hard, harder time dealing with them. 